My name is Victor Furman. Some call me the Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me now, and we will explore these topics and so much more with fascinating guests, authors, and experts who will guide us to Destination Unlimited. In 1985, the group Till Tuesday composed and recorded their hit song, Voices Carry. As adults, many, if not all of us, carry voices. What I mean by that is within our memories, we store the voices and words of parents, relatives, caregivers, teachers, and others that left an impression upon us as children. As we strive for success and happiness in life, some of those recorded voices play back in our psyche with words like, not good enough, not pretty enough, stupid, too fat, too skinny, and other charged expressions that may interfere with the life we aspire to. Some of these recollections may be complete and real, and some may be colored by perceptions that we embellish them with as life ensued. How can we move past these old programs and live a true, authentic, and joy-filled life? My guest this week on Destination Unlimited, psychotherapist Ira Israel, says we can, and in doing so, accept who we really are, find our true calling, and discover the path to authentic love that is our birthright. Ira is a licensed marriage and family therapist and professional clinical counselor. He holds advanced degrees in psychology, philosophy, and religious studies. His DVD series, including A Beginner's Guide to Happiness and Mindfulness for depression, along with his sold-out Esalen workshops, had given him a wide international following. He joins us this evening to discuss his new book, How to Survive Your Childhood Now That You're an Adult, A Path to Authenticity and Awakening. Welcome to Destination Unlimited, Ira Israel. Good evening, Ira. Good evening, Victor. Thank Thank you very much for having me. And thank you so much for joining us. So, Ira, when we welcome guests to Destination Unlimited for the first time, we ask them to share a bit about their personal path, and yours includes a very diverse and creative background. Tell us about Ira Israel. It's super interesting that you begin this show mentioning Till Tuesday, Voices Carry. First of all, I'm a huge Amy Mann fan, and I, I remember that video when it came out. But also, um, uh, my journey spiritually started in 1985, the year that you mentioned, when there was a terrible car accident, and that set me on my journey, you know, asking those at first existential questions, which became spiritual questions, and then essentially psychological questions. So after the car accident, I was concerned with what's the meaning of life. And for eight years, I studied philosophy. I lived in, um, I went to the University of Pennsylvania, and then I got a master's degree in philosophy. I ended up uh, in Paris and just studying film and literature and art and music and finding out how all these um, artists and musicians <clears throat> made sense out of the world. And then in 1994, I was in Thailand, and I uh, walked at full gate into a, a door frame, and uh, there were, I was on an island called Koh Samui, and there was no hospital on the island. And um, by chance, uh, we ended up uh, speaking to this woman, and she said, let me heal you. And, uh, and I said, no, thank you. I don't believe in witchcraft. And uh, she said, well, there's no hospital on your There's nothing you can do. Like, let me heal you. So um, I laid down on the table, and uh, a woman healed me with her hands. And at that point in time, the previous eight years of studying Western uh, philosophy kind of um, collapsed in some way when you, when, you, when you have your paradigm shifted radically in just one second. So I ended up uh, studying Buddhism, Hinduism, and uh, I, I went to Duke University to study parapsychology and just see how other people envision reality and the universe and what other people consider to be normal life. And that took me um, to the uh, UCSB, where I went to the Department of Religious Studies and, and got a second graduate degree studying uh, spirituality, the history of yoga, the history of uh, Buddhism. And then about Let's see. Eight years later, 
I got into one of those wonderfully uh, highly dysfunctional relationships, and that got me studying psychology. So then, uh, for about eight years, I, I, I took another graduate degree in psychology, and then I was teaching yoga at Rodney Yee Studio in Piedmont, and a woman came into my class, and the, the, the interesting part about this is for any part during those 25 years, people on the outside might have looked at my life and said, oh, you know, he's living in Paris, or he's studying Buddhism, or he's doing this, like, he's lost, or, you know, he's a lost soul, or something like that. But it didn't, it wouldn't have made sense to anybody. I was kind of just flying by the seat of my pants, studying what I wanted to study, and being very indulgent intellectually. And then all of a sudden, um, when this woman came in, I, I watched her hands go down on the mat, and her back open up, and literally, I don't know how bizarre this sounds, but I heard... <laughs> A, a voice or I got a message and it said it's time to teach it's time to give back so all of those 25 years of studying Buddhism and yoga and philosophy and music and literature just all collapsed and everything just made sense and since uh, 2009 I've made those five DVDs I've been teaching at Esalen I've been uh, in private practice as a psychotherapist and it kind of all just uh, came together in some very um, magical way you know, what you're describing sounds like a very synchronistic life and this concept of synchronicity that when we open ourselves to a certain path, the elements will come to us and we have the choice whether to accept them or, or reject them and then move on. It sounds like that's the path that you've led. Exactly. Um, it's, it's really um, been quite magical in some ways because when, once you open up to listening to the universe and for me I love the word vocation because in all the studies on happiness I'm, I'm citing Sonia Lubomirsky's book How the How of Happiness right now and, and in particular the German studies that she followed where people who have jobs anything that people do for money irrespective of how much money they make are fairly miserable and people who have careers which is something they do for a long time and mostly again for the money are slightly less miserable and the only people she found that were happy were the people who know their vocation so voco in latin means calling mm -hmm. so when you you know joseph campbell famously said follow your bliss so we have tastes and you know for me, my case led me to museums and to concerts and to study literature and things like that. And again, it didn't make sense at the time. But now when I'm teaching these classes and I can call from a, a wide range of, um, uh, of subjects that people, you know, uh, that resonate with various people, it all makes sense. Absolutely. Now, what inspired you to write How to Survive Your Childhood Now That You're an Adult? So there's an epidemic in our culture of depression and also of anxiety, of stress. And I wanted to find the root causes of it. As I say in the book, I don't, I don't, I, maybe it's not some rogue gene for Americans that caused 20 million of us to take antidepressants every day. Let's look at the structure. Let's look at the frame. And so there's three things that I think buttress Western civilization, capitalism, the, the system called capitalism, and then the second system called science, and then the third called religion. So, um, you know, I want to take a look at what we perceive as normal reality and, you know, um, basically deconstruct all the things that we consider to be correct or right. And I use a lot of, I think, um, consciousness raising analogies, like I say in the book, Nobody ever went to a feudal lord and said, you know, someday you won't have serfs and, you know, you know, there'll be factories and people will congregate in cities and they'll be paid dollars or pounds or francs or something like that. You know, you can't explain the future right now. Like, we don't know what the next society is, the next, uh, the next civilization is. But right now, all the things that, are, are, that we consider to be normal are, if you, from my point of view, they're imploding. Whether you look at, um, you know, the, our society is really um, torn apart by the conservatives who are seeking to conserve that white uh, hegemony, and then the progressives who are trying to progress to whatever the next civilization is. So we have a culture war going on at the time, and 
you know, a lot of us uh, are stressed out because we feel we have to work really hard. We've been sold this bill of goods regarding, uh, you know, buying a house and having a mortgage. The average mortgage is two hundred twenty thousand dollars, and going to college, the average credit, the average college debt when ch- when kids leave is twenty six thousand dollars. Spending beyond our means, the average credit card debt is four four thousand dollars. So I wanted to analyze all the things that I think are causing anxiety and depression and say, hey, let's let's raise consciousness around these things. And, you know, maybe it, maybe we don't need all this medication. Maybe we just need to re-envision how we're interacting with each other. Mm, that's fascinating. This, do you think everyone grows up protecting themselves with a facade or turning themselves into the people that we think our parents, teachers and other role models want us to be? Well, most concisely, I say we become what we love and we become what we hate. And both are inauthentic. So what I'm saying is that there's a part of us as children who want acceptance, love and approval from our primary caregivers. So we do what they say and we we imitate them. But there's a conflicting influence where we're trying to individuate and become our own selves and we rebel and we become the opposite. And so what I'm trying to do is get people to, you know, we live in this incredibly privileged society and we have so many luxuries and freedoms. So what I'm um, provoking people to do is to decide who they want to be and then having the tools to be that person and lead the life that they really want to live, the life that will bring them the, the most pleasure, meaning and happiness. My guest is Ira Israel. He's the author of How to Survive Your Childhood. Now that you're an adult and we'll be back with more of Ira after these words on the Ohm Times Radio Network. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Tune in to The Practical Intuitive, Mind, Body, Spirit for the Real World with me, host Robin Fritz, Mondays at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 Eastern. I'll cover personal and business intuition, animal communication, mediumship, space clearing, past life regression, shamanic insights, energy healing, soul choice, and more, all to help you Tap your own intuitive and healing skills. No ifs, ands, or buts. This is Terry Van Horn, and I want to invite you to join me for my weekly radio show, Healing Light, on Own Times Radio, every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. On Healing Light... We want to bring love, light, and blessings into your world. You can find out more about us at www.healinglightonline.com. Blessings. Adopt U.S. Kids presents Multiple Choice Parenting. You've messed up your daughter's haircut. Do you, A, get spiritual? Mom, where's the mirror? Beauty is within. Oh. B, find the positives. Less time blow drying, more time texting. Or C, show empathy. Mom, you really don't have twinsies. I kind of love it. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. For more information on adoption, visit AdoptUSKids.org. A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt US Kids, and the Ad Council. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this evening is Ira Israel. He's the author of How to Survive Your Childhood, Now That You're an Adult. Ira, are we all children in adult form? Because it seems no matter how grown up people become, there's a part of them that operates and gets reactivated like a small child or the way they did as small children. I heard a wonderful quote yeah, uh, once. Someone said, adults are just children with better excuses. <laughs> <laughs> I really nice. love that. So for me, there is a there is a wounded child in all of us, and we act today as adults in some 
way subconsciously and we're trying to retroactively get whatever love that the wounded child feels that he or she failed to get from their primary caregivers, their, their parents or older siblings. So there's things that we do now today where if you, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that comes out in psychotherapy where there's certain behaviors and if you really think about them, um, even if you're 40 or 50 or 60 years old, you're, you're doing it to please someone who's, you know, probably <laughs> deceased, but most likely no longer in your life. So I'm just trying to raise consciousness around these behaviors and, and, and give people more freedom and more choices. Mm, you know, we don't have, at least yet, the capability of creating a wormhole in time traveling. So we can't go back and change our childhoods. But do you think it's valuable to reflect on trauma of the past and look to resolve or correct it in current life as an adult? Or is it, waste of, is it a waste of time to explore our own history? Well, I believe that it's imperative to do it, but I also believe in doing it quickly. I do not believe, uh, you know, psychoanalysis four days a week for five or six years is incredibly indulgent. So what I do is I work with people for maybe an hour or two, and it's just about creating a narrative, one that, that makes sense to you so that you can just say, oh, well, uh, my father was aloof, my mother was withholding, and I am, I crave this because of this. So, it, so again, it's not about excavating your entire childhood. It's just about knowing the certain um, events that, that, that both scarred you and then just formed uh, who you want to be. Because what happens is the mind takes whatever traumas we experience as children and they say, and it says, wow, that was really humiliating. That was really painful. I'm never going to let that happen again. And so you form prejudices, fears, expectations, resentments. Maybe you started weightlifting so you never got beat up again. Or maybe you became the sarcastic guy. Or maybe, you know, I don't know what happened. But there are things that are traumatic to, that happen to all of us, the rites of passage. And they cause us to, to become overreactive. And, you know, those are also our, our triggers later in life. The things that, that, that spin us out are really, you know, from the traumas being reopened from our primary years. Why do you think so many of us remember having unhappy childhoods? Were all parents really that terrible? Or do we have terrible memories focused only on the bad stuff? The mind has a negativity bias. So, again, I think the, the primary job of the mind is to try to stave off future trauma. And it does that by creating the, these, you know, woulda, coulda, shoulda, didn'ts, the, these hypotheticals, the, these, these fears, these resentments. These, and what it does is it's taking ideas from the past and, push, and, and, and projecting them into the future. So, again, one of, the, one of the other components about learning authenticity is learning how to be present, learning how to be here now. So I, I'll say to people, you know, we need to accept all of the, the, the fears and prejudices and, and resentments that our minds created, the facade, the false self that we created to survive our childhood and try to get our emotional and psychological needs met as children, we need to accept all those things, and we need to be able to show up in a loving way as if those prejudices, you know, they, they serve their purpose, and now we can, you know, be vulnerable and try to use new tools to get the love that we really crave. Is, is it hard to let go of trauma, or are we in love with the memories of our youth or younger years, whether they're good or bad? Um, this is a fascinating subject. So... Yes, it's very hard to get rid of trauma, um, and the reason is because we're terrible with grief at our culture, particularly for men. We're taught to walk it off, um, buck up, don't be a baby, don't be a this, and we're not allowed the space or the time to, to grieve. Um, there's an interesting example within um, uh, the DSM the DSM-5, the bereavement uh, ex exemption, was eliminated. And that's fascinating to me because, you know, it used to be you'd go into a doctor's office, you'd have five of the nine symptoms for depression, and the doctor would say, you know, here's an antidepressant. But 
if somebody had died within the past month or so, there was a bereavement exemption. And you say, well, I can't actually diagnose you with depression because, you know, you're grieving. And in the DSM-5, I believe two or three years ago, they eliminated that because the doctors found, the doctors who wrote the DSM found that the pharmaceuticals that were, using, that were being used to treat depression also worked on bereavement. But there, there's, a, there's something not right there. You know, you don't, your, your, your child doesn't die and you take a pill so that you can go back to work. You know, we really need to give people the space to process traumas. So let's go back to childhood, uh, each of our childhood. The first person who we lost, uh, a grandparent or a parent or, or brother or sister or some, some close family member, what was the effect of that on us? Well, our own mortality is something that, you know, is, is, is so um, impactful because mortality in general, you know, you just don't get that concept. And then your parents explain it to you like you will never see your grandmother again. You know, she's gone. You're five years old or seven years old. And, you know, there's no way for a child to, to really – assimilate that information and then you know at some point in time it pierces a child's consciousness and you start to get to realize wow like this is i'm going to miss this person and again you know um it's one of these things we really need to we, we, we should teach grief as well as how to have loving relationships and and uh, tons of other uh, emotional and psychological tools in our primary schools i mean there's a lot of kids that really it doesn't pay to teach them biology or math or a bunch of other subjects like but you know they could learn or they could really benefit by uh, learning how to have loving relationships how would you teach grief that's fascinating how would you teach it so again it's a process there's no there's no one way personally i i think that everyone has to find their own ritual so as a society we have the ritual of um uh, a funeral and then in judaism there's the ritual of sitting shiva but for each person you know you need to find how you're going to come to terms with reality not showing up the way you expected it to. Because your brain says, oh, this person's in my life. They'll always be in my life. And then, you know, when, they, when they, they're not there, reality didn't show up the way you expected it to. And that's what the, that's what the problem is. So there's a, there's a reconciling we have to do between our subconscious expectations and reality. So we, and again, this is learning how to accept what is and you know it's a it's a it's a process there's no pill there's no one particular way i am uh, personally for me it's about finding rituals and allowing the time and space to um to really process the the these losses traumas and and grieve the the fact that these people are are not going to be in our lives anymore as an interfaith minister and and working with people who are bereaved uh, uh, we, we learn and we know that there's no right way to grieve. For, for, for some people, grief manifests in, in tears. For some people, grief manifests in laughter and getting involved in things that take their mind away from the grief. So there's no right or wrong way to grieve. But do we have the, have we lost the ability uh, or maybe never had the ability to truly listen to each other during a time of grief? Yes. And so in the book, I say in the chapter on attunement, Mirror neurons do not fire via text message, meaning, you know, we really need the old rituals. You know, for, for me, for most of humanity, for most of the history of humanity, we lived in tribes of 150 people. We would be in our extended family and, you know, you and I would be walking across the plains or we'd be farming together. We'd be breaking bread together. We'd be spending our days together. And now most of our interactions are through a screen. Uh, and we're hitting the glass with our finger and we're, you know, doing likes on Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram or one of these uh, software programs. And I feel like it deludes us into thinking that we're really connecting. But what we really need is, is hugs. We really need to, to, to commune with other people, to be there face to face, because that's where the healing takes place. I mean, personally, I don't even like doing um, psychotherapy through Skype. And I would definitely refuse to do it, uh, you know, through texting or anything like that. You need eye contact at the very least. And you 
also there's things going on in, in the air. There's pheromones. There's there's smells. There's there there's just so much information that is nonverbal, and we really need to 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 figure out a way to really be with other people and to let that healing process take place. Should our educational system include classes in learning how to truly listen? Absolutely. I mean, we're just taught how to speak, really. And, and well, I, I make a distinction in the book and in my classes between listening and making someone feel heard. And so my experience of the world is that a lot of our interactions with people are um, unintentionally, emotionally invalidating. When you say uh, the sky is blue and I say, yeah, but it's going to rain tomorrow, that yes, but actually has a psychological ramification and it's invalidating your emotional experience. So I use the tools of reflective listening and then Marshall Rosenberg's um, nonviolent communications. I give all sorts of tools in the book so that you can sit with someone and you can say, so if I hear you correctly, you think it's going to rain tomorrow. And then, yeah, I do think it's going to rain tomorrow. And then you say, oh, that's interesting. I think it's, it, it, you know, it's not going to rain tomorrow or whatever it is. But this mandate for the truth always comes with a dialectic, which is, you know, you put up the uh, thesis and I put up the antithesis and then we try to get to the truth. But in doing so, we're kind of negating each other's own emotional experience. So I really um, work with couples to try to leave right and wrong and getting at the truth like outside and just have this freedom of expression and have the other person be able to mirror the other person's uh, affect and their, 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 um, their shoulders and just sit with them and really connect. Absolutely. My guest tonight is Ira Israel. He's the author of How to Survive Your Childhood. Now that you're an adult, Ira, please tell our listeners where they can get your book, they can get your book and find out more about your work. Well, please visit my website, www.iraisrael.com. I teach at the Esalen Institute, and there's tons of free videos um, on the Internet, on Amazon, how to get the love you want. Um, you know, uh, Just visit my website, and that's the portal into many videos and books and things like that. And we'll be back with more of Ira Israel and how to survive your childhood now that you're an adult after these words on the Ohm Times Radio Network. You're listening to OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Are you in an interfaith relationship and thinking of getting married? For 18 years, Reverend Lori Sue Brockway has been creating personalized, loving, and romantic ceremonies for couples of all faiths and cultural backgrounds. Reverend Lori Sue's sensitivity to the needs of interfaith couples is reflected in the compassionate and inclusive way she addresses the concerns of parents and families. Reverend Lori Sue Sue is also the author of several best-selling books on interfaith weddings and wedding vows. Selected as one of the top interfaith officiants by New York Magazine, Reverend Lori Sue serves couples in the New York metropolitan area and beyond. Find out more at her website, yourinterfaithwedding.com. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site but a spiritual dating site with a purpose to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free. AscendingHearts.com You're not wired to have a response to this sound. But when we introduce a new stimulus, save the food. We're helping to stop food waste. Save the food. For tips and recipes, visit savethefood.com. Brought to you by NRDC and the Ad Council. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this evening is Ira Israel. He's the author of How to Survive Your Childhood Now That You're an Adult. Ira, how does it affect our lives when we can't release the resentments that our minds create? Is it more harmful to us than it is to others? Well, the quote is, um, I mean, that everyone's familiar with, resentment is like poking yourself in the eye and waiting for the other person to go blind. Right. You know, resentment is like, 
uh, drinking poison and waiting for someone else to get sick. So, I mean, it's very um, difficult to explain to someone, particularly when the trauma is so close, that your resentment is only hurting yourself. You're causing your own suffering by not accepting reality. And in the book I say, you know, if you came home and saw your child or spouse uh, sitting on the couch trying to shove a, a square peg into a round hole, you would stop them. And yet this is what your mind does all day long. It's trying to, 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 to have a better past. So the, the quote that I use is by Lily Tomlin, and it says, uh, forgiveness means giving up all hope of having a better past. Mm. So again, this is accepting, but uh, your mind doesn't want to do that. Your mind says, no, you know, I should have married this person. I should have gone to this school. Uh, this, this shouldn't have happened. That should have happened instead. And, you know, that reality didn't show up that way. Reality was something different. So, you know, the sooner you accept it, the sooner you'll stop um, causing your own suffering. Do we get hung up at this lapse of uh, this uh, chain of shoulda, coulda, woulda? Yeah, totally. And again, this is a, there's an irony here because your mind was built to do that in order to keep you safe. It creates these woulda, coulda, shoulda, didn'ts, these hypotheticals. You know, uh, I, I would... Uh, be a better basketball player if I were 6'5". I'm not 6'5". I'm not good at basketball. There's no point in wishing that I were somebody else. I'm, I'm me in this lifetime, you know, and it, <laughs> everyone else is taken, and I just have to work on, on me and my happiness. You write that the best way to forgive people who have uh, disappointed or betrayed or even violated us is to forgive everyone unequivocally. That's hard mm -hmm. for a lot of people. Yes. Um, on the other hand, unforgiveness is our desire to share our suffering. So there's a beautiful piece in the New York Times last Sunday about the musician Jay-Z. And he goes into this thing that he learned through therapy where when he sees uh, an angry uh, African-American man in a bar and the guy says, uh, what are you looking at? Are you looking at me? And trying to start a fight. He thinks to himself, um, basically, why are you pointing your suffering at me? Like I see, you know, and he, he reframes it as the, 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 the angry, tough guy saying, don't see my suffering. So, I mean, that, that's the, 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 it's, a, it's a great um, understanding of reality. I believe the, the, the first noble truth and the second noble truth of Buddhism, um, that consciousness is the cause of our own suffering. You know, uh, pain uh, it does not cause suffering. We cause suffering by trying to avert pain and cling, cling to, 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 to joy. So it's really a, an interesting psychological understanding of the human mind that, that personally I learned through Buddhism. Mm. How, how do we learn to forgive something, someone or something like uh, uh, the people who have committed tremendous atrocities like, like the, the, the Nazis in World War II or, or people of that nature, the recent situation in Myanmar with the, uh, the slaughter of so many people? How do, how do we learn to forgive something like that? Well, I, um, here I have to bow to Fred Luskin and his Forgive for, for Good book, uh, and, and sitting with him on several occasions at Spirit Rock and at Cal Berkeley, and what he provides is a new definition of forgiveness. So forgiveness does not mean condoning anyone else's behavior. That's the first thing. It does not mean condoning anyone's behavior. It also doesn't mean that you have to be friends with this person. What it means is you're releasing your right to resent that something took place. So again, as I said in, in the video that you watched, and as I say in the book, when the trauma is very close, there's no way to forgive anybody. And, and the example that I often use is from His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Uh, when I've sat with him, you know, if someone will say, who's your greatest teacher? And as the you know, primary spokesperson for Buddhism in the, in the West, everyone expects him to say, the Buddha. And unequivocally, every time I've sat with him, someone says, who's your greatest teacher? And he says, the Chinese who killed two million of his people ruthlessly, you know? And mm. so 
again, when you're sitting there when, and, and tragedy is going on and, the, the, you know, there's a show or some kind of terrible uh, slaughter, you're not saying, thank you, this is my greatest teaching. But at some point in time, when you have um, a reframing uh, 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 and you want to move on and, and, and reconstruct the narrative of your past, most often what I've, I've seen is people accept that these things happen, know that they can't change them, and it's better for their own good to, quote unquote, forgive. It's better for their own wholeness, for their own personal um, uh, integrity. For, there's just, there's just um, so many benefits. Rather than carrying around uh, bitterness, grudges, hate, um, and again, you, you can't change these things in the past. So the sooner that we accept them and learn from them and then you know, try to pay our love forward, uh, use skillful solutions and say, I will not pay my suffering forward. I, I'm going to be the change I want to see in the world and forgive. Absolutely. Some people have experienced terrible traumas, as we, as we know, abuse, neglect, incest, abandonment that changed the course of their life. They may have ended up in a foster system or turned to crime or drugs or behaving in a manner similar to the people that inflicted the trauma upon them. How can people lost to trauma find value in your book and in your philosophy? Well, again, grief is a process, and it's learning how to accept reality as opposed to the way our mind said reality should have shown up. You know, I, 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 I shouldn't have been in that car accident. My parents shouldn't have gotten uh, divorced. My sister shouldn't have, you know, died. Whatever those things. And, and again, it's about accepting what is. So your mind fights these things, and it does so to try to stave off uh, potential future traumas. But again, this is, my, this is my claim, that those things that traumatized us in the past they're not happening right now, and yet our mind, uh, that's what ressentiment, the, the meaning of ressentiment, re, is again, sentiment is just sentiment. So you're feeling things right now, and this is what PTSD is. You're feeling something right now because your body's saying, brace for impact, you know, like you're not safe. And yet, you know, you're in your bed, and it's 2017, and you had a hot meal for dinner, and yet your body thinks that, you know, you're walking in Iraq in 1992, and, and there's, you know, a potential bomb that's going to go off. So, um, again, being present and being grateful for being here now, you know, you, Rick Hansen has this beautiful, beautiful quote. He says, you can't pull all the weeds in the garden but you can plant flowers. Mm -hmm. So for me, we have to learn how to replace the resentments that our mind creates with gratitude. And if we're here today, you know, we all have things that we can be grateful for. Where we live in a, in a very, very safe, relatively safe, privileged society. You know, irrespective of, I walk, oh, I woke up this morning and there was soot, a layer of soot on my front lawn uh, because I there's a there's a terrible fire like four miles away from me. But relatively. You know, in terms of the history of humanity, throughout the history of humanity, the vast majority of human beings never reached 40 years old, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm 51 years old, <laughs> you know, and, and there's, a, there's just a lot of things to be grateful for. Absolutely. You know, if you wouldn't mind sharing in the, the video I saw that you had put on your website, you were talking about... Uh, an event that happened after your accident uh, when you were working with someone doing some mirroring. Would you share that with our listeners, please? Well, I think the, what you're referring to is um, I received a Facebook request from uh, the gentleman who was in the back seat of the car, uh, Mike Beeson. And it was it had been 29 years we, we hadn't spoken. And there was a week of my life I was in the passenger seat, and I don't remember um, what happened. And so I wanted some clarity on that because – it's those things that repressed that are repressed that like you know that come back and 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 cause uh, various reactions that are you know not pleasant. So I wanted to to talk to him. So I uh, I gave him a call and uh, we hadn't spoken in, in in at least 25 years. 
And he told me about uh, his life, and uh, he adopted two children. He had two children with his wife, and he had been mayor of his town. His father uh, worked at the hardware store, like right where I grew up in Stanford, Connecticut. He was still there. And I told him about my life, and he said to me, um, you know, it's it's always bothered me that you were the one who was sitting in the death seat because we actually fought to not be there, and I won. He said he won. And he had this guilt for, you know, that I had to go through the two years of uh, surgery on my face and my leg. And so we hung up the phone and uh, one of my uh, indulgences living in Santa Monica is I I have a Vespa and uh, I use it to get around uh, because the traffic is quite bad here. And so um, I'm driving my Vespa late in the day and and this thing happened kind of similar to how we started this conversation where, um, you know, there was something just hit me, it struck me, like this this something, and I pulled over and I was crying, and um, I just pulled the phone out of my pocket and I hit redial, and he picked it up immediately, and I said, you know, Mike, you know, thank you so much for this conversation uh, this morning, and I need to tell you that one part of it really, you know, didn't resonate with me because I've been teaching this radical acceptance and mindfulness and this new understanding, and I, I need to tell you that it, it couldn't have been you in the front seat. It, it was supposed to be me. Mm. And for me, you know, we all need to embrace every moment of our lives. You know, Cheryl Strayed does this very beautifully in her book, Wild, which I quote. And there's so many examples, but really, um, you know, Looking back on our lives, it's just a, it's, it's, it's a, you know, what Einstein says, you have a choice. Everything is just happening at random or everything is a miracle. And that's a choice that you make. So you can you go through life thinking, oh, woe is me. This is so terrible. And this terrible thing happened and that terrible thing happened. But as Shakespeare says, there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. There's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. So again, you have to realize that this is human consciousness, and it's doing this thing to keep you safe. And if you're safe, then you don't need to you know, uh, listen to all those negative thoughts all the time. My guest is Ira Israel. He's the author of How to Survive Your Childhood. Now that you're an adult, and we'll be back with more of Ira after these words on the Ohm Times Radio Network. Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions, but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit humanityhealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Circle of Hearts Radio is a sanctuary on the airwaves. Join me, Grandmother Alaya, in the circle on Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern, as I share information to both enlighten and nourish your soul. Hi, this is Sylvia Henderson, Intuitive Life Coach and Energy Healer. Are you ready to elevate and rise way above your normal? Be sure to listen to my show, Intuitive Transformations, on Own Times Radio, Sunday evenings at 9 p.m. Eastern. Get the inspiration you need to transform your life. When Dad needed help getting around, I became his driver. Any daughter would do the same. But soon enough, he needed help doing more things. And it was up to me to be his personal shopper and financial manager, too. And before I knew it, Dad moved in with me. So I became his cook, his personal assistant, his physical therapist, and even his nurse. When I started taking care of Dad, I didn't realize all the roles I'd have to play. But no matter what, I know I'm still his daughter. We understand the many roles you play. And to help, we created an online caregiving resource center. At aarp.org slash caregiving, you can find resources and connect with the caregiving community. Together, we can better care for ourselves and the ones we love. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving to learn more. 
A public service announcement brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this evening, Ira Israel, author of How to Survive Your Childhood Now That You're an Adult. You know, you were talking in the last segment about accepting things as either miracles or as just matters of chance and and looking at life uh, as as something that's really special is something that's really manifesting in a way that's supposed to manifest. I had a wonderful uh, teacher when I was in the new seminary of New York. It was Rabbi Joseph Gelberman who founded the seminary. And uh, he used to teach us about this expression in Hebrew, hakol beseda, uh, which uh, when you would say that to someone, they'd say, how's life? Well, hakol beseda, meaning it is what it is. But he said, that's not what it means. He said, it means that everything is unfolding according to a divine order, to this magical plan that exists, that is here for us. And if we, re- if we recognize life that way, we can live a much fuller and richer life. Do you agree? A hundred percent. I mean, this is your choice. You have to decide how the universe is operating. So the term for me that's really um, important is dharma. And that, that translates into um, how, how, again, how the universe out there, everything is happening. And then uh, that's on the macro level. And then on the micro level, you have to know what the universe is informing you, what role you're playing in this larger project of humanity, human beings on planet Earth, and all the things that are going on in our universe. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yes, absolutely. Mm. If parents tell a child we did the best we could, does that make the child who was wounded feel they are responsible for creating their own pain and havoc? Well, there's a part in the book where I talk about surfing the paradoxes of life. And so the prefrontal cortex, our brains, the first part of or the front part of our brains, it's designed in a binary fashion. fashion. Boy, girl, black, white, uh, tall, short, uh, good, evil, good, bad. And reality out there is not happening. It's not occurring in a binary fashion. So there are things that are paradoxical. So I, I use this example in the book where every child has to say, my parents did the best they could, uh, because they did. You know, there's no parent except sociopaths who try to be bad parents. And yet the tools, if you read um, Alice Miller's drama, The Gift of Child, or several other books, you know, there's a generational thing that takes place. Let's say, you know, the parents after World War II, they were incredibly fear-based. They were afraid that there would be a second Hitler. They were afraid that uh, Russia was going to drop the bomb. So they had a style of parenting that was based on fear. And then what happened later with, with my peers, what I see, is that um, they, they, there was a subconscious thing that went on, and they, when they had children, they said to themselves, wow, I don't want my kid to hate me as much I, as I hate or dislike my parents, so I'm going to be less a fair. And I'm, if my kids want to smoke marijuana, they can smoke marijuana my, because my parents oppressed me and they told me not to smoke marijuana. You know, they, there's, a, there's this like flip flop that happens. And what I say in the book is, is there's no perfect parent. There's no ideal parent. And as children, we have to just understand that our parents did the best that they could. On the other hand, if a parent says, hey, I did the best I could, what that's really signaling subconsciously to the child is that if you're messed up, if your life isn't perfect, then it's your fault, not ours. So there's, a, there's a, an irony there. There's a paradox there. And it's a very healing um, event in a child's life. It usually takes place on the parent's deathbed when the, the parent says, I love you, you're okay, and if I had it to do all over again, I just would have loved you more. And how does accepting our childhood, no matter how it transformed, I mean, how it manifested, impact and, trans- impact and transform us? Well, again, you can't go back and change the past, so what good does it do complaining about it? You are who you are today, and every second of your life went into making that person. So uh, there's, it's just, it's pointless. It's absurd. Again, it's like walking into your home and seeing your child trying to shove a square peg into a round hole, you would stop him. So there's no point in not accepting something you can't change. 
Yeah, that's the truth. You know, you mentioned uh, the generation, my generation, and you mentioned your generation. What about these newer generations today? How are they looking at parenting? It's so unbelievably, I, I, the word in my mind is awful, um, but I should just uh, tone it down a little bit. Um, the technology is not our friend. I, you know, our iPhones and our computers are frenemies. And the, the kids that I have in, in my office, they really have a hard time connecting with other human beings. I, I take classes at UCLA and there, I, there's 40,000 young people with their heads cocked at a 45 degree angle with their earbuds in, you know, just plastered to, I don't even know what they're doing, but they're not making eye contact. They're not hanging out with each other. And even, you know, if, if you go to restaurants these days, you see couples sitting at the dinner table you married this person you you were enthralled by this person this person was like so magical at some point in your life and you're sitting there on your phone mm-hmm. you know this is a very very serious problem we need to we need to figure out a way to you know to put these devices away and you know that dopamine fix that we get from from pressing on the glass and and hitting things and liking things and and it's really detrimental to our own psychological well-being I remember growing up and sitting at a dinner table and uh, basically uh, feeling that this was the centerpiece of my life, that I could be there with my my family and we could share what was transpiring in our lives and the world, etc. And it was so meaningful. And then I see people in restaurants today, as you mentioned, sitting around a table and each of them has their, their phone or device in their hands and they're not paying attention to each other. What are we missing well, I, I learned so much when um, after working in Manhattan for two years, 1989 to 91, and eating lunch at my desk, I, I moved to Paris, and um, someone said, oh, you should meet this guy. Uh, his name was Laurent Boutana, and he was a producer for this artist, Milan Farmer. And he just said, you know, I called him up, and he, he's a renaissance man, and he said, uh, let's have lunch. And I meet him at a restaurant. And it was one o'clock, and I'll just never forget this. Like, we, we, you know, we, he just took command and, and ordered uh, some things, and he ordered a glass of wine, and then uh, we had another glass of wine, and then, you know, and, and all of a sudden, it was 5.30, and we were sitting there drinking coffee. And I was, I was just thinking of the stark juxtaposition of eating... <laughs> It was chicken kung pao, I'll never forget it, at my desk in Manhattan, just like, you know, you're on the phone and you're doing things and you're just kind of shoveling food alone into your mouth in this really bizarre manner. In contrast to sitting there with this other human being talking about art, literature, music, love, politics for four and a half hours on a Monday afternoon. Mm-hmm. And I said, wow, this is, this, is, this, is, this is what life really is. You know, eating Kung Pao chicken at my desk in Manhattan, that's, that's not being alive. You know, being alive means um, partaking in Western civilization, being aware of what's going on politically, e- economically, you know, helping other people, understanding uh, the, the disparity uh, between, you know, the, 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 the impoverished people in our culture and the wealthy people people in our culture and really trying to to um, be the change we want to see in the world. There, there's that beautiful quote, um, we are the ones we have been waiting for. It's Alice Walker. We are the ones we have been waiting for. So no one's going to make the world a better place if, if it doesn't start with us. You know, there's no, one, there's no one else out there. So for me, that means being a part of the dialogue of Western civilization, and and that entails uh, being culturally astute, being being responsible. If a if a you know some incredible book is out there, I, you know I have to read it. If there's a, a gallery opening or if there's something that's really um, meaningful that's going on, I, I want to be a part of it. Absolutely, you know you you emphasize developing the authentic self. What is the authentic self? So I break down authenticity into five components. Attachment, atonement, attunement, presence, and congruence. And just very quickly, I'll tell you. So attachment is being aware of our attachment styles. And those developed during the individuation process when we were 6 to 18 months old. And they probably have um, some impact on the way we relate to other people, as well as money, as well as tons of other things later in life. So we need to be aware of that. 
The second one we've already discussed, and that's atonement or at one mint, and that's forgiving everybody, releasing your resentments about things you cannot change. The third is attunement, being able to connect with other people. Um, I say in the book, one hug equals one million Facebook likes. Mm. And Presence is the fourth one, which is um, practiced through either meditation or yoga. And yoga for me is just a moving meditation. And that's having tools to not let our minds drag us into a non-existent past or into a not yet existent future. And then the last part is congruence. And that's having your outer world match your inner world. And for me, that's best explicated by the quote in the beginning of the book by Andre Gide, who says, it is better to be hated for what you are than to be loved for what you are not. Mm. Mm. Powerful. Very powerful. What would you like readers to take away from how to survive your childhood now that you're an adult? I would like readers to take away the understanding that we have choices. We don't have to buy into what society tells us is, quote unquote, uh, the good life, which means essentially, you know, the American dream of owning a house and having children. Like we're, we're living in this incredibly privileged time where we can decide who we want to be and we can go out there and find the tools, eating correctly, sleeping uh, the right amount of hours, um, finding the jobs that will that'll fill our hearts and, and nurture our souls. We need to really um, understand the privileges that we have in this society and not get caught up in the competition and the rat race and that whole keeping up with the Joneses. You know, on, on, on people's deathbed, nobody has ever said, I should have spent more time at the office. <laughs> when people are dying, everybody has the same experience. They appreciate the experiences of their lives and the people around them. And usually, if they have a regret, they say, I should have loved more. Mm. So for me, you know, I'll, I'll raise consciousness in my classes and I'll say, raise your hand if your first thought upon waking this morning was, how can I love more people today? Beautiful. Because, because it's not. And that's why if you want to be happy, there's only one thing that correlates strongly with happiness, and that's the quality of our intimate relationships. So we have to learn how to love more. The wisdom and experience of Ira Israel, his book, How to Survive Your Childhood Now That You're an Adult. Ira, please tell our listeners where they can get your book and find out more about your work. The book is available in all bookstores, and if you go to my website, www.iraisrael.com, there'll, there'll be um, links to Amazon and to tons of video and, and YouTube um, uh, classes, things like that. So, And please join me uh, uh, either at the Esalen Institute or via Skype uh, if you have any questions. Ira, thank you so much for joining us tonight and sharing your message. Thank you very much for having me, Victor. And thank you for joining us on Destination Unlimited. I'm Victor, the voice Furman. Have a wonderful week.